I'm John Kane, and I welcome you to Let's Talk Native on this Saturday, May 2nd, 2020. While this program, this program may not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do encourage, in some cases, start conversations. We kind of break the rules here for Native Radio. We don't do prayers or buffalo speeches or get all mystic. We, uh, we, we take a tough look at uh, history, oppression, and survival. We talk about culture, the arts, politics, and identity, and we may step on a few toes along the way. But our real goal here is to, is to break down what separates us um, and bring, bring people together. We will take on the false narratives and, we'll, and we will provide critical thinking to all that's heaped upon us. And we do it all right here from the, Seneca, from the Cattaraugus Territory of the Seneca Nation, live from the Cattaraugus Territory of the Seneca Nation. So let's talk native. But first, let me remind people that our audio streams on our website, which is www.letstalknative.com. And I do encourage you to stop by our website. We have links to our podcasts and to our videos. And we have our, uh, our store tab that you can go and check out some of the t-shirts and stuff like that, that we have. So I do encourage you to check out our, our, uh, our website. But that's where you can also listen to a live audio stream. Or uh, when we're not live, you can hear programs that are looped 24-7 uh, so you can catch up on old programs. <clears throat> um, we take we video uh, stream the the show on Facebook Live via Facebook Live on our Facebook group page and pages, and it's shared across a bunch of the other uh, Facebook group pages as well. We take the audio and we put it up on SoundCloud, <clears throat> which goes out as a podcast on all your favorite podcast platforms. We take the video and we put it up on our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. So you can check out um, this show, the show that I do for New York. Uh, on WBAI and our short form videos on our YouTube channel. So I encourage you to subscribe to our podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and, um, and try to catch uh, some of what we're serving up here. <clears throat> Look, I am the show's host and producer, and I'm joined here in studio by Jake Proud, who is managing our audio and our video. Um, let's get into it. Um, start with some of the numbers. <clears throat> the where, where are we at here? The U.S. says, um, as I said, they went over a million. They're at a million... 1,160,585 cases. Um, the death total is now gone beyond um, the prediction that, uh, that Trump had, uh, had made. He's not just beyond the 60,000, but beyond the 65 and the 66,000. They're at 67,441. That's the number um, of deaths that the United States has accumulated. I'm uh, still not sure the envy, the, the, the envy of the world, but we'll talk about envy in a little bit here. Um, Navajo Nation continues to really rack up the number of cases. And, and although um, their death totals are heartbreaking, they are, they are not that high yet. Um, but uh, they're adding, every time I look at the totals and I'm seeing they're adding 100 a day, 100, and, you know, today was 166 new cases they added today. They're at 2307. They have surpassed the state of Idaho and are sitting there right even with the, uh, with New Hampshire. So that means that there's, that they have more cases than nine U S states. Um, and they're dead even almost with, uh, um, with New Hampshire. So their, <clears throat> their number of cases is, uh, is an anomaly for their population. It, it just doesn't, it just doesn't even make sense. Um, and, and we, we grow more and more concerned because that's an awful lot of people, um, that are being infected, um, and are, are and we know they still haven't tested everybody yet. So this is going to be, um, it is one of the biggest concerns and they, you know, they may be an outlier in terms of a group that is being looked at. I'm not sure that they're an outlier for uh, for quote unquote Indian country though. Um, it's just gaining attention because they are the largest single population of um, uh, of a native group. Uh, their numbers are you know somewhere in the in the 250 thousand range, but the the population on territory is somewhere between 150 and 175 thousand. So the idea that they've got 2,300 cases is uh, is kind of significant. So. Um, Again, for as all the buzz is about certain states loosening up the restrictions and you know trying to open the economy up, it is worth noting that yesterday was the second highest day for new cases um, since this whole thing began. So that was last yesterday, Friday. The highest day was the Friday before. 
So it seems like for whatever reason, these things are spiking as the week goes on and then drops off on Saturday and Sunday. Um, that has probably more to do with uh, with the system than than the spread of the spread of the disease. So that's why the numbers are always going to be somewhat. Um, they have value, but they aren't the full picture. And the way and who's being tested, where are they being tested, how many are being tested? I still don't think the United States has reached two percent. If they they may if they may if they have reached two percent, they've just reached two percent in total testing. Um, so two percent of the total population, and so again the, the numbers are somewhat suspect. Look. I had Bob Henley join me for my New York show, for my WBI show on Thursday. If you get a chance, uh, you should check out the, the program that we did. It's up on SoundCloud. It's on the podcasts. Um, and, of course, we've got it on YouTube and it's on Facebook. Uh, you know, Check out the interview with, with Bob Henley. It is, um, it's, it's worth listening to. Bob Henley is a, uh, an investigative journalist. He writes for Salon uh, and a few other outlets. Uh, he's done radio. I, I met him while he was working for WBAI. Um, we have been kind of asking some of the same questions separately. We weren't we weren't collaborating at all. But some of the questions that I was asking were the same questions he was asking. And as an investigative journalist, he's been checking into some of this stuff. And his articles have kind of paralleled a lot of what I was saying. So it seemed like it was the right time for us to come together. And uh, so he joined me on, on the show on Thursday. Uh, no Regan this week, but um, uh, but Bob Henley and I, we chewed this up for an hour. And I think we, you know, together we, we put, we shine a pretty good light on some of these things. And of course, Bob has the the resources to, to directly um, interview morticians and, and people who are in the funeral home business and uh, and EMTs and that kind of stuff. So it was um, it was it was a really enlightening conversation. And and I got I got to tell you, for all those folks who are, are are trying to insinuate that these numbers are inflated, Bob and I took took are still taking the exact opposite approach. We think the numbers are much higher than what they're telling uh, telling folks. And um, and while the antibody tests are showing a bigger spread than the total number of positive test results from the, uh, from from being tested for COVID nineteen. There still is a real problem with coming up with the with the right numbers for the for the total amount of deaths. So uh, check out the show. I'm, I won't re reiterate what we talked about, uh, but I encourage you to check it out. And again, that's the podcast from uh, from my Thursday WBAI show. Let's talk with John Kane. So uh, check it out. All right. Um, look, I, I do. One of the things I, I've talked about before on the show, and, and and this whole theme came from Ed Schindler, my buddy who sits in, you know, through their different parts of the year. He mentioned the seven deadly sins. Now, <laughs> as I mentioned them, I'm, this isn't going to be a religious show. I'm not talking about, you know, you know the pious and the sinful. I'm, I'm not getting into that. But what is listed as the seven deadly sins, and, and it's kind of interesting, because I don't even subscribe to these um, to to what this is supposed to represent. Because a lot of what the seven deadly sins was about was about controlling the underclass. It was about saying, "Oh, you know, pride is a terrible thing to have. Don't you be proud?" You know, because that was that was the the exclusive purview for the uh, aristocracy. Um, they didn't want the poor to be envious. They didn't want them to be gluttons. They wanted them to be very frugal and, and make sure that they didn't overconsume because they, they wanted them to produce, not to consume. It's not, it's not the capitalism that we know now where you got to have people both be the consumers and the producers at the same time. Um, they didn't want the, the poor to be greedy. They didn't want them to be, you know, they wanted them to be orderly. So I'll get into what the seven deadly sins are. But but it's interesting because the the civilized um, folks are the ones who promoted this thing. See, these aren't even, aren't even sins as far as um, they're not listed in the Bible. These aren't like the like the Ten Commandment sins or, or anything like that. It's not. It's nothing like that. Um, but here, this is what the seven deadly sins are uh, are known to be: pride, envy, gluttony, greed, lust. Sloth and wrath. Now, if you don't know what sloth and wrath are, <laughs> uh, sloth is just me laziness, just the idea of being lazy. And wrath is is about vengeance, you know, and um, and that kind of stuff, getting revenge. 
Now, the, you know, when, when Ed and I talked about this on the show, we, we talked about how these, look, these things here, all seven of these character flaws or characteristics have become a part of the American culture. The, these aren't considered sins, you know, for most, you know, not really. Pride? Envy? Look, these you could use these things for marketing slogans. This could be Madison Avenue's guidebook on how to sell stuff. Pride, envy, gluttony. Yeah, they want you to eat more. They want you to, um, you know, to, to be envious of, of your neighbor. I mean, look, they got perfume called Envy. I mean, this is a, a, a pride. I mean, you American pride. That's a, you, you see that those two words together constantly. It's 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 built into the system. Uh, lust. I, there's probably there's, there's probably a perfume called that too, um, and, and then sloth. Look, the whole everything that's sold to you is to make your life easier so you can have more leisure time. It never does that, but you know. The, but but the idea of of lounging and and uh, and, and being lazy. That's I mean, look. That's what people are envious to to, to do. Uh, ironically, and then wrath and the idea of vengeance. So as, as I'm looking at, you know, how, how this has become the, you know, almost the, the characteristics of Americans, it, it dawned on me that the, the one person that epitomizes all seven of these is the president of the United States. I mean, Donald Trump could not be more defined by these seven characteristics. I mean, if... In fact, if you didn't know what the seven deadly sins were, and if you wanted to, I mean, if you wanted to break it down and describe Donald Trump, you could just list these seven these seven words, these seven concepts. I mean, look, there is nobody that is more um, conceited or narcissistic than, than Donald Trump. That's pride, envy. <laughs> look, you you can hear it in every one of his speeches when he's talking about you know the power that that um, the authoritarian leaders have. I mean, it's like he's envious of them. Putin. You know, uh, uh, um, uh, G, G. I mean, th these these are the guys that, that he's envious of. I mean, even the, like the, uh, the the Saudi prince, you know, Erdogan from uh, you know from Turkey. These are the guys that he wishes he could be that strong man, because that's what he's trying to exude. So I mean, the the envy that he has for others, and and you can and you can tell this because even his narcissism and his conceit, those you know, pride and envy go right hand in hand. Because you, you know, the whole idea of, of asserting yourself is because you're envious of somebody else, and you're always trying to, you know, you know, to self promote. I mean, you, you look at him when he's at, at functions. There's nobody who represents the gluttony. I mean, look, I, I'm not recommending anybody look at his fat ass, but there's 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 no question that this guy, you know, like so many Americans, I know, and I'm not talking about food here. I'm talking about things like, like energy, like. Um, I know it sounds like gluttony and greed fit or go hand in hand too, but I mean, United States is considered the the energy gluttons and the and the resource gluttons of the of the planet. You know, consumerism. I mean, consumption. You know, when, when people think about consumption, they think about what they consume, what literally put in their mouths. There's nobody who is uh, who um, represents you know gluttony more than than Donald Trump. Lust. Look, this is a guy. You know, the misogyny, you know, that this guy is, isn't just guilty of, he's proud of. You know, his uh, mail order bride stuff. I mean, you know, the whole bit, you know, sleeping with, uh, you know, uh, you know, with, with porn stars and then, and, you know, paying them off to, you know, to hush them up. I mean, all that stuff. I mean, there, there's no way that you can't associate this with, uh, you know, with Donald Trump. Sloth, this is a guy who's too lazy to read security briefings. When, when, when he gets together with his cabinet members. This is a guy who won't even read the material. There's nobody who epitomizes being, this is the laziest guy who's ever sat in the White House. And sit he does. You know, the, I mean, the, the, the most active thing this guy does, besides, you know, and, uh, look, he swings a golf club. He plays golf. But the, other, but the most active thing he does is play with his phone on Twitter. I mean, that is not exactly, um, you know, a sport that's going to get you in shape. So there's no question that, you know, that's, that he fits the bill for sloth. And then when it comes to wrath, there is nobody that is more vindictive 
than, than Donald Trump, whether you're talking about the press, whether you're talking about somebody who's, who's shown some elements of disloyalty, the, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, the way he reacts, you know, even militarily, I guess. But this is, and I, and I know people who've known Trump, I mean, even all of the, uh, you know, the bankruptcies, some of that stuff is born out of the vindictive nature that he has, the, just the idea that he wants to screw people. I mean, this, is a, this guy never really had to file for bankruptcy. He used bankruptcy as a means to build his business. I mean, that's, that's just vindictive. That's just vengeful. So, you know, it, it dawns on me that, you know, even, even though this is a theme that we've talked about on the show before, that it, it probably made sense to bring, to dust this one off a little bit. And again, I thank Ed for bringing, you know, kind of bringing this to my attention in the first place. But, but again, see, when the elite and the rich and the famous and, and the, the aristocracy um, talk about these things being sins, they just don't want anybody chipping away at their pride, at their envy, at their, you know, their gluttony and greed and lust and, you know, no. So the history of the seven deadly sins has always been about controlling the proletariat, you know, controlling the people that are beneath you. Let them know that ambition, I mean, I mean, ambition was considered a sin. I don't know if you ever read Great Expectations, the Dickens, uh, you know, story. The whole idea was about was to criticize somebody have ambition to raise their standard their, their, their standard in life. There's no, you, you got to accept where you are. This was about keeping people in, in their places. All of these things are about that. So it's fine for the wealthy to be you know, prideful and envious. You know, and, and, and I, say, I say that, I mean, Trump's always trying to suggest that, that he has made the United States the envy of the world, which he says is a good thing to promote envy. And you know what, you know, considering he's a, you know, uh, just a, you know, more of a TV person than anything else, a reality TV star, if there is such a real thing. But, but honestly, this is kind of where, you know, where these things have value when it, when it comes to, to marketing and selling stuff, selling a brand, selling yourself. And, and you know what, Americans are drawn to it. You show somebody who can stand up there and, and that you can be envious of, then, you know, and, and that you want to be like, you know, you would think after seeing how this guy carries himself, the most people would be repulsed by him. But there is a significant part of the American population, the U.S. population, that just wants to be just like him. And if they don't want to be like him, they're glad that there is somebody like him to, you know, to, I guess, compensate for their own shortcomings, I guess. So... You know, God, I, you know, I didn't want to do a whole show on the seven deadly sins, but it just it occurred to me that as I'm as I looked at these things, that Trump embodies them. I mean, not only has this become part of if the, if the United States has a culture at all, I mean, because it, it is you know they claim to be the melting the melting pot and all of that stuff. I mean, ar arguably, there are some countries. That are not bound together by culture; they're just bound together by polit by politics. And the United States doesn't have a uh, have its own distinct culture. But if they did, this would represent it. I mean, you know, you think about it, you know a lot of what has become what people consider the American fabric. It, most of it's been when born out of the. Um, the adversity the United States has caused, whether it was slavery, whether it was dispossession of land or, you know, um, uh, the idea of subjugating women. I mean, you, you think about so much that, that has been done in the United States and what perseveres through the adversity, everyone wants to take pride in. But, you know, but it's, it's, it's like I was just having a conversation the other day. When they teach kids in school about American history, they purposely jump from a topic, but they don't explain. When they talk about the Constitution and they're talking about the apportionment of uh, of representation, you know that that whole three fifths compromise that you know the, the the idea that that you could count black people as less than a human being, but the fact that they were counted at all was not so they would be represented. It's so their bodies could give their slave masters, their plantation owners 
more representation in the U.S. Congress. I mean, think about that. This was so a person who owned slaves could have more political power. The fact that they were already asserting this, this, you know, this inhumane power over other human beings wasn't enough. They needed to have political power within the, uh, within the federal government as well. Because those slaves weren't being represented in this, in this apportionment clause. Their bodies were being counted for their masters to have more power. But they never teach that. You know, and, and look, if you taught, if you, were, if you were really proud of the fact, and there's pride again, right? If you were proud of the fact that, yes, there were mistakes made and that you, you, um, that you made the correction. So you amended the Constitution you know, several times along the way to, to, to make up for the, you know, for the racism and for the, the crimes against humanity that your country was around. But they never addressed it in the first place. So you don't even encourage the idea that, yes, you have to acknowledge that mistakes were made and then, and then work to correct them. That's, that's, part, that's part of the problem. I mean, that's, that's just the way the United States promotes itself as, you know, infallible. I mean, you ignore, you know, you, you don't tell the truth about what the Civil War was fought over. You know, you, you make it sound like it was just a struggle between states' rights and, and, and centralized government. Really? That's, that's, that's the way you're going to sell that thing? You don't tell the truth about World War you know, I or World War II for that matter. You don't tell the truth about how the United States ignored the atrocities that Hitler was committing against, uh, against the Jews. You don't talk about how Henry Ford was, was actually a, a, you know, a, a sympathizer to, to Hitler's regime. He was a Nazi sympathizer. Completely anti-Semitic. I mean, you don't talk about any of that stuff. You don't talk about the fact that the United States dropped, it was the only country in the history of the world to drop two nuclear weapons on a small island country that was already on its knees um, in, a, in a completely asymmetrical you know, battle uh, um, war. I mean, it's, the United States dropped two atomic bombs on, the, uh, on Japan. Six months after the largest aerial assault that ever that the, the world has ever seen on on cities like Tokyo. See, nobody ever says to nobody says, "Well, yes, the United States dropped uh, you know atomic bombs on you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki." Well, why didn't they drop one on Tokyo? I mean, nobody, I mean, kids don't even know to ask that question. And you know what the answer is? <laughs> the answer is because they bombed the crap out of Tokyo six months before. They already leveled Tokyo. They just didn't use nuclear weapons. They used uh, they used conventional um, and mock and a lot of them. They used conventional um, incendiary uh, devices. So, and, and they it wasn't just Tokyo that they bombed. So they did that in in March, and then in August they they turned around and they dropped two atomic bombs. Just why? Because they could. And you know what? You come out of that. And as you, you know, and again, no, nobody's going to teach this to kids. They're not going to teach, you know, how many civilians, that these are civilian targets, both what took place in March when they bombed Tokyo and what, with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Keep in mind, for those of you saying, yeah, but they bombed Pearl Harbor. They bombed a military base. They bombed a naval base. They didn't bomb Honolulu. They bombed a naval base. But when the, when the United States bombed, uh, you know, bombed Japan... They, they didn't distinguish at all between the civilian population. They said, well, we, we, you know, they, had, um, they were making bombs right in the cities where you know, civilians were involved in all that stuff. Well, you know what? Civilians were involved in that in the United States, too. So, I don't know. I, I just think we don't teach this stuff in, in, a, in a way that makes... Um, I, mean, I, I think the United States in particular is so worried about tarnishing their um their image why because of pride and envy and greed and lust all of that stuff <clears throat> i mean it, it is what has become that american fabric uh, most of american history is built either on lies or omissions sorry I'm, I'm not saying there is no truth but i'm saying you you omit enough truth to where the truth becomes disingenuous or you you simply don't you, you simply lie and and that's what that's what most of most history that's taught to kids. I mean, they they don't teach about you know the, the crimes that these presidents committed against native people, 
or the atrocity that slavery really was. They teach slavery as if it was just this little period of time. And, you know, and that's, that's a crime. That's criminal. And to misrepresent what those atrocities were <clears throat> is really just a terrible thing to have done. And, you know, that's why, you know, that's why I do a show like this, so we can talk about some of this stuff. All right. Hey, we're at the bottom of the hour. When we come back, I, I'm going to, I want to re revisit, take a, take a look back at 1990 and even a little bit of the, the decade of the 90s. But, um, and, and, and there's a reason I want to do it. Uh, you know, Jake and I are going to work, uh, be working on some things, but I'll talk to about a little, talk about it a little bit more when we come back. This is John Kane, and this is Let's Talk Native. We'll be right back. <laughs> All right, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. I want to give a shout out to my sponsors, uh, Ross and Holly John and the RJE Family of Businesses, uh, the folks at Grand River Enterprises and Native Wholesale Supply, and 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 all those who 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 have either supported the show in the past that help us. Um, look, we're in our in our tenth year. We're almost finishing our tenth year here, um, and we we couldn't have been doing this for this long. Uh, without the support of people who some have come and gone but but look even those who have supported us in the past who may no longer be offering financial support um you helped us get to where we are right now um wherever that wherever somebody might consider that to be um i also want to thank those who on occasion will drop a check in the mail and uh and give us a boost when we oftentimes when we when we need it the most uh even without doing some sort of you know, solicit solicitation for for additional funding. Uh, it just seems like, man, people just come through when uh, whenever we get you know a little behind and that kind of stuff. So I appreciate it. I want to thank also those who share the show and um, you know talk about the show, carry the conversations forward. That's what we're at, what we're always trying to encourage here. So um, I thank you for contributing your comments, for contributing your your time to listen to the show. Um, and, and to share the show. I, I, we appreciate it uh, immensely. Um, all right. So 1990, I mean, for one thing, 30 years. I mean, 30 years have passed since 1990. You know, I was just thinking the other day, when I say something that happened 30 years ago, I find it a little bit almost <laughs> disturbing when I think, 30 years ago, I was already 30 years old. I wasn't even, I mean, now it seems like 30 was young, but man, when I was 30, I felt like I was, you know, man, I was, I was, I was older. I was, <laughs> I had reached it, right? But, you know, I look back now and, and man, I, 30 years ago, I was already 30, I'm 60, so obviously the math makes sense. But 30 years ago, 1990, well, I'll tell you, 1990 was, um, was not only um, one hell of a year, and, and we'll get into some of the, you know, what made 1990 what it was. But even the run up to 1990 and then the, the entire decade of the 90s, the, you know, our tax battles with, the, you know, with, with a couple of governors leading up to 1990. I went through, you know, all the stuff that was happening in Oneida. And, you know, and so I would begin the decade spending some time in, in a federal prison. So, I mean, this is, you know, this is what 1990 was um, was about. I mean, the biggest thing that people know 1994 is uh, is the Oka crisis, Gunnazadage, and the whole battle between uh, Mohawks, the Gunnazadage, and the uh, and, and the Canadian government a at all, because there were other you know there were U.S. was in you know kind of discreetly or covertly involved with some of what the United, uh, what Canada was doing uh, with, with Mohawks as well. Um, but 1990 is when the Oka crisis became. Uh, well, when it started, and then would ultimately become this uh, this milestone and almost a turning point in how Native people viewed their sovereignty and what they were willing to fight for. So what happens is, um, you know, look, we, we've been battling um, at, at a bunch of different levels, things like est establishing businesses. You know, we were gaining a foothold and in, in selling tobacco on our territories and creating an, econ an economy, you know, up until that time, we didn't have an economy on our territories, you know, and, you know, even the, 
the uh, tribal organizations, the, the the administrations didn't really have much in the way going on, you know, uh, until until the 90s when individuals and among those individuals were the guys who, frankly, that I were associated with, the warriors, the ones who said, no, we can sell. We have the right to sell cigarettes. We have the right to sell fuel and we don't have to pay New York state taxes. We don't have to pay Canada taxes. We, you know, we don't have to pay, you know, um, this is what we have the right to do on our lands. And we began fighting for it, and and asserting that those, those rights, you know, and that would that would be a battle that we're still fighting today, but fighting today, knowing that we're still doing it, that even though we've been fighting this stuff since you know since the late '80s, and 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 now we here we are, 2020, we're still selling the products that the state claims that we don't have a right to do it, and and Canada's never really fully conceded. I mean, we're 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 bat we're battling these huge powerhouses but where the line really got drawn in the sand was in Gunazadage and in Gunazadage in a small area that um that the folks called the pines they had a little cross box there they used to picnic there and that kind of thing well the town of Oka it's almost unfortunate that that the the battle in Gunazadage and Gunawage would be dubbed the Oka crisis because Oka is the the white municipality essentially uh, just outside of you know runs up adjacent to Gunazadage, and the mayor of Oka decided they wanted to expand what was a nine hole golf course to eighteen, and they were going to expand it by claiming Mohawk land, and so through spring the spring of 1990 i mean this time of year our people are already saying no you're not going to expand the golf course here so the conflict you know begins before the summer sets in and you know we've got people that are that are you know making a they made a barricade they said no you're not coming past this point so in the summer of 1990 july it would be july 11th the uh the sq which is a the, the provincial police in quebec on the behest of the Oka mayor, would um, go in at, with force. They came in with bulldozers and uh, you know and tactical gear and uh, and then opened fire on on the uh, on the people who were, were manning the barricades. Turned into you know a hail of bullets. One one police officer was killed. Uh, it, it immediately went from the SQ to the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And then ultimately all the way to the to the Canadian Army being called in. It turned into a 70-day standoff. But this whole a 78-day standoff, this whole thing, you know, just um I I don't know, it it, it galvanized um and a solidarity across Canada and the US, more so more so in Canada, but um across native territories. And and our people stood by. And uh, and stood with uh, the holdouts that were that you know that were representing the standoff uh, in in the Gunnazadage. Uh, even as the thing <clears throat> would ultimately end after seventy eight days, the legacy of standing up to the Canadian government, I mean, uh, and and all of the the weight of what Canada had thrown at them, was something that became uh, you know, a, a, a point of pride. Our kids were. Always, you know, they wanted to wear camouflage. They wanted to, they, they would actually, if they could get a run, whoever heard of kids playing with barbed wire? But because of the Constantine wire that was, you know, draped across and, uh, you know, that became part of the symbolism of the, uh, of the standoff, kids saw, a run, you know, a loop of barbed wire or something they could play with in their, in their driveways, in their backyards. Kids play with barbed wire. I mean, so this whole idea of resistance you know, if anybody didn't know what the unity flag was before, they 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 certainly knew knew what it was after the. In fact, when you, if you look online for the for the unity flag or the warrior flag, some of the places that sell them they, they say they call it the Oka flag. I, I think even these ones when I, when I pick up, it's got a little little sticker on it, it says Oka on it. This flag's got nothing to do with Oka. You know, but but that's that's how ingrained what took place in in the summer of 1990 became. You know, I, I myself, I um, I had already gone through through a, a, a seven week federal trial when this stuff erupted. I was already convicted in a, in a federal trial, just a sham of a trial in, in in Syracuse. I was going to prison, 
so I went, I said, hell this, I'm going up to, I, I went up to Ganyange and I was a part of, you know, a, a relatively small group, but a group that was just waiting for the, for the call. You know, that way we could be close. I, you know, I got the call from, you know, kind of the organization that I'm associated with and, and went up there and I don't even know how long I spent up there. It seemed like I spent a much longer time than, it seemed like I was there for a while. And every day, all we, we couldn't find anything on American news. It was all, you know, it, it was all covered up. It was all, you know, blacked out. It was a media blackout on the U.S. side. But we saw racism in ways that, that people had never seen. In fact, Jake and I got a video coming out real soon here that's going to highlight a little bit of that Canadian racism. But we saw racism in ways that most people, um, you know, most, I don't even think Canadians realized how much the, you know, racism was, was within them. You know, the idea of burning effigies of, na of Native people and stoning cars. I mean, even old people in a, in a car smashing out windows. I mean, this is what we, we experienced through, through all of this stuff. But this was 1990, 30 years ago. And, and we're going to do, you know, Jake and I, are, we're going to look at, do a couple of retrospectives, not just on Oka, not just on Genazadage, not just on the, the battle, but where does it leave us now? You know, when we've gone through so many of these things, and not just, you know, fighting for land rights, which, which is what that is. And by the way, the golf course never got built. So if you're wondering who wins the battle, well, we won. We never, the golf course never got built. That land is still Gunnazadage. It is not Oka. So, and then as we get into the, into the 1990s and, and we, we battle Mario Cuomo over taxes, you know, the, the Atia case in 1994 happens and, you know, uh, Cuomo, um, you know, ends up getting replaced by, uh, you know, by George Pataki. So we have a whole nother governor with a whole different, you know, uh, philosophy going from a Democrat governor to a Republican governor, but the same battle. So we went through two, two governors, two, you know, two different parties. Of course, you know, you also have, you know, Brian Mulroney, who is the, uh, you know, the, the prime minister of Canada. And, and, you know, and you go through the, the 90s with, you know, the, with the federal government here. I mean, you go through all of this stuff, right? And we persevere. I'm not saying we didn't take our lumps. Like I said, I, I began the 90s. I, I began the, most of that decade, uh, you know, two years of it in, in a federal pen. So we took our lumps, but we came back stronger than ever. But I don't know that we do a proper a retrospective. I mean, I, like I said, um, Tim Johnson, a friend of mine, who used to run the, uh, he, you know, he, he was part of the, the Native American program at, uh, um, at Cornell, and he was, you know, ran the, the museum um, in, um, in Washington, D.C., I met with Tim one time and he said, why do, how can we never look back and say, how did we, how did we win or how did we survive? Can we, we never go back and say, this is how we accomplished what we accomplished in the tax battle. This is how we accomplished what we accomplished in, in, uh, in Ganazadage. We don't do it. We don't do a retro. So we don't teach it going forward. You know, one of the things that when, when the Senecas became essentially the, the front line on the battle with, um, uh, with New York State over taxation, we, you know, they invited, you know, some of us to, to come in from, from Mohawk territories. And, and we talked with, with folks and we, and, we, and look, we couldn't believe, you know, the, the, how willing the Senecas were to fight the state. Uh, and, and we almost had to, like, try to temper some of the enthusiasm you know, we, we didn't, we had to remind people that, you know, killing a cop was never going to be a good thing. Even though we might be justified in doing it, what they would do in retaliation would never, you know, so if, even if you could get away with it, they would take it out on somebody. So it might be your cousin that pays the price. Either, either they're going to kill, they're going to, they're going to get their pound of flesh. So we, we talked about how to, you know, different strategies. And of course, the Senecas had much, many of their own strategies as well. We, you know, I'm not suggesting that that the, the Mohawks led the thing or anything, but we, we, we came and we supported. And that's how, that, you know, that's how I, you know, became a part of this community. But when I look back at the 90s, there, there are lessons that should be drawn from that. So one of the things that, that Jake and I want to do, we, we want to look at Gunnazadage. We want to look at that, that resistance. And what can we take from it? Where, you know, 
where are we now um, as a benefit from what took place in 1990? And, and have we squandered it? Have we squandered whatever, um, whatever we accomplished there? I mean, and we may have. I mean, I, I think this is kind of the, the, the so-called retrospective that we want to do. Can, and if we have squandered it, can we dust it off? I mean, look, there were a number of years that in Canada, they had the Mohawk War Society listed as their number one threat to national security. They did, you know, these McDonald Laurier reports to determine what was the um, uh, the likelihood of, uh, of of an insurgency led by indigenous people, and and of course, on their mind, on the forefront of their mind was the resistance that came from uh, from Mohawk territory. They they always got really really wary when they knew that we were traveling, you know, a, a bunch, and that we were spending time t uh, speaking to people in other communities. You know, were we inciting people? No. We look anytime that we got called to, to come meet with people, it was because they were already incited, and they wanted to, you know, they wanted to know what lessons were learned. But we never documented much. And look, and Jake and I are going to we're going to do a couple of short videos on the whole thing, and it's not going to be a comprehensive view. But the whole point of even even bringing it up today, and and the videos that we will do. In the run up to the 30th anniversary of the uh, of the Gundozadaga crisis, we want to invite the conversation. It, look, 30 years ago is a long time. Most of the people who would have to stand on the front line of any kind of battle today either weren't alive or were just little little kids then. Because look, you don't want us 50 and 60 year olds on the front line anymore, you know. So. So for those of you who have none of the experience coming out of the 90s, you have no textbook to read. You there's Look, there's a couple of documentaries, but none of them do a look back. Most of them are documentaries about what happened, you know, just, and there's some good ones. I mean, the, what's the one called? Gunna Zadagi, 270 years? 230 years. 200, yeah, yeah, years of resistance or whatever. That's, it's a, it's a great film. And I, I showed it a few times in, um, in, uh, New York City and uh, you know, done, done some screenings of it. 270 years. 200, yeah, 270 years of resistance. And, and, and it really is a good film. And, and as I'm showing the film in, in, in New York City, people said, how do I not know anything about this? Well, and that's the problem. Not only do, do obviously white people, non-native people have no idea I mean, and, and I'm not just white people. Look, for all the resistance that the, the Black Panthers and the Civil Rights movement, movement came, I was surprised how many, how many black people had no idea that Mohawks had stood up. Even though, look, there was some collaboration there. I mean, there's some great photos that show folks like Muhammad Ali and, you know, and, and Dick Gregory and these guys, you know, collaborating with Native people. But most people are, are oblivious to it. So how, how do we take those circumstances? And look, we paid a price for the, the for winning the battles that we won, but we accomplished something. But we don't look back. I would dare say today, if you were to look at all the people who are still are, who are in the tobacco business, or or any business that is utilizing native, for lack of a better word, sovereignty, our autonomy, our distinction, our rights. Anybody who's doing a business, whether it's gaming, whether it's, you know, gas or, you know, tobacco, whatever, you know, cannabis, whatever. Anybody who's doing that stuff. I don't know how many people know why we still can do what we do. Because you know, I, I want to be clear here. As far as New York State is concerned, every carton of cigarettes on Seneca territory, in Mohawk territory, Oneida territory, well, you know, wherever... Every card of cigarettes, if it doesn't have a New York State stamp on it, New York State considers that to be contraband. And you know who else does? The federal government. Why? Because the federal government, they passed a law called the, the Cigarette Contraband uh, or Contraband Cigarette Trafficking Act, CCTA, where the, the law is so obscure and it doesn't take into account anything, you know, any, it doesn't, it doesn't take us into account. So what the CCTA basically says is that any tobacco in a state that requires a stamp that doesn't have a stamp is considered contraband unless it's you know still hasn't been been sold if it's still you know um, in the wholesale market so to speak hasn't been stamped yet but if it's on a shelf if it's if if it's either if it's um for sale retail 
or in a consumer's hand and it doesn't have a, a stamp on it, as far as the federal government is concerned and, and New York State is concerned, it's contraband. The federal government never takes into consideration, well, New York State doesn't have any authority on what we do on our territory. They'll even somewhat back that idea. They understand that the states are limited in what, uh, as far as the authority. Is. But when they pass a law like that, that doesn't even mention us. So you have a federal law that makes a reference to a state regulatory process. And then the state says, well, you see, the federal government says those cigarettes are contraband. So they're contraband because the federal government says. Yeah, but they use state law to make that determination. It's like this circular reasoning that makes no sense. And, and I've talked to, to federal agents, ATF agents, as well as folks from the state. And as far as they're concerned, what we're doing on our territories today is still, um, they, st they still believe they have the authority to, to tax our sales. I mean, in fact, the view they have is the only sales they, that the state will acknowledge they don't, they don't have the right to tax is a sale on Seneca land to a Seneca. Even me as a, as a, as a Mohawk, a Gunjagahog, living here on Seneca territory, as far as the state's concerned, if I go buy a carton of cigarettes, the state has a right to buy, even though I live here. I mean, this is the absurd logic that the, that the states have. But even though that's their view, they know they can't enforce it here. And so why is it? I mean, and how do we exist in this limbo between... Jeez, I'm not knocking my mic over. How do we exist in this limbo where... The state has this view about such a big part of our economy being illegal or unlawful as far as I'm concerned. And yet we, we managed to have cooperative agreements with gaming. Are they that cooperative? Or has the tension associated with the state's lack of, an, uh, of ability to enforce their regulatory authority over us, does it spill over into how abusive they are on, on so many other things? And yes, it does. We don't win in court. I mean, look, I, one of the, I, I got a chance to testify as an expert witness on, um, on a cigarette case where a Seneca wholesaler was transporting cigarettes to a native territory. And so this is a, a Seneca licensed wholesaler located here on Seneca territory, taking a native brand of tobacco to another native territory and the tobacco gets seized. Not only does the tobacco get seized, but the driver and the company get assessed millions of dollars worth of, worth of fines. Now, I, I testified in the driver's um, hearing, and, and I'm not saying it was just my testimony alone, but, but ultimately, um, it got thrown out. But the owner of the company is still battling the state. The state is still asserting that we don't have the right to take a native product from one from a native territory to another native territory. This is and so when we do it, we're doing it always at risk. I mean, from 1990 till now, 30 years, we've been fighting the same battle for 30 freaking years. Now, I don't know if people realize what are the risks? I mean, a lot of times, you know, I think people got involved in, in tobacco saying, well, I see somebody else made a bunch of money selling cigarettes. Well, I can make it. I can sell cigarettes. They don't realize that some of the people who pushed this in the, in the beginning, and some of those people were, were the warrior, warriors, essentially. In, in Gunawage, for instance, on the Canadian side, it was one of the first places that, that tobacco began to be sold. And, and again, part of the reason that it was, uh, you know, that it was... Uh, it was, it was so profitable was because Canada, like New York State, has a huge amount of t tax on tobacco. So we did it. And although there were always these threats of people coming in, they rarely came into our territories. You know, we, we had standoffs with, again, two governors through the 90s, both uh, Mario Cuomo and, um, and George Pataki. We literally got to the point in our fight with George Pataki in the 90s where George Pataki comes into Seneca territory in Western New York, holds a press conference, walks by our, the group that were, you know, we were part of the, the First Nations Dialogue Team, League of First Nations Dialogue Team, and walked by and said, I think you're going to like what I have to say. We weren't convinced we were going to like anything this guy had to say. But when he came in and he said, I'm making an executive decision 
to recognize the sovereign right of Native people to conduct these businesses. Basically, Pataki threw the towel in. He did, he did a complete 180 on this whole idea of, of, of the state coming after us. Now, I, don't, I, I think there were still a, a lot of unanswered questions even when he did that at the time. But we essentially stopped, stopped, you know, stopped fighting with, with the state after that and, and had a, you know, a relatively peaceful few years until you know, Spitzer becomes the, the governor in the, in the 80s, although that only lasted for not very long because of his, um, his prostitution problems. <laughs> but then we end up battling you know, David Patterson and, um, and Mike Bloomberg suggesting that David Patterson need to cowboy up against the Indians. Literally, he said that too. But but we're still at the we're still in a, in a battle, and now the battle shifts towards you know the next lucrative business we get involved in, which was gaming, and and you know gaming became a, a big part of what the uh, what the the public finance was for for native territories. But we fight, you know, we we fight it in Aquasasta, we fight it in uh, in in Seneca territory. Battles with the feds, battles with the states. But if we don't look back. If we don't look at what we accomplished by standing our ground in Gunnazadage and in Gunnawage and, and across, look, one of the things that happened, and, and we saw it again in the, the Wet'suwet'en uh, battle here, what was learned out of the 1990s, what was learned out of Gunnazadage in particular, was, although I was in the camp that wanted everybody to go there, <laughs> What was learned is that everybody didn't have to go there. That you could block railways, you could topple power lines, you could do things all across. Well, you know what, what Canada realized and began to do an assessment of it was how vulnerable their their infrastructure was because native people lived where all of their their main lines of infrastructure were, and that they were vulnerable. And we were pissed, and we felt empowered. What comes out of 1990 is probably the most successful run of economic advancement. Whether you like tobacco or, and some of the things, you know, or gaming or any of this stuff, regardless of what it was, what it did was it changed the dynamic. The, there was a look for, for many, many, many years, our men had to, had to leave our territories to earn livings, and many still do. I mean, the, the whole idea of iron workers and, and the, con the construction trade, everything from heavy, heavy equipment to, you know, to pipe fitters to, you know, uh, iron workers, high steel workers, all of them. Look, that became a big part of what our men did to bring money back to our territories. So we didn't have um, a, sus a sustainable economy on our territory. We had to leave to do it. What came out of after 1990... And, and actually was already building when 1990 had. You know, one of the things that, that people questioned was were the advancement we were advancements we were making through the late 80s up until 1990, was it worth risking all that stuff by standing our ground? And the decision was standing our ground is too important. You know, and, and that's always the, 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 you know, the big challenge. The big challenge is can you, are you prepared to suffer the consequences of standing your ground? for a longer term goal. So that's what we want to revisit. So for now, what I guess what I would suggest is brush up a little bit, brush up a little bit on 1990. We're going to do, you know, we're going to do a retrospective on not only um, the battle in what is known as the Oka crisis, the, the battles uh, of resistance from Gunnazadage and Gunnawage, but we're going to, we're going to start to look at what we accomplished coming out of the nineties, standing up, fighting for our right to do commerce on our territories. We're going to do that. So uh, brush up on your own little history and, uh, and we'll compare notes as we do it. So um, that's the show for today. So I want to thank you guys for, for listening. We'll be back here on Tuesday. We'll see what we got coming up by then. Um, in the meantime, it's May and we're still in the middle of the COVID pan uh, pandemic. Uh, so we'll see what the next few days uh, hand us before we get to Tuesday. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Yahweh.